question, how does the reconciliation process in Kosovo function right now and from the independence of Kosovo until today? And what role do external actors, especially the EU, have to do with it? Uh, it's interesting. In Kosovo, we are going through a very interesting period of time when it comes to dealing with the past and, and the reconciliation. Now that we have the special court, we have opened yet another chapter that is super sensitive. And now, you know, I, I can see how uh, difficult it is to talk about the past, especially after 20 years. Um, and even in Kosovo, there is no clear narrative on what has happened. There is no documentation. I mean, we all want justice. We all want reconciliation, but we don't know where and how to start with. I mean, so far, the process has been something that has only been focused on the political elites, being the governments, which have been misusing uh, all this process uh, and, and have been using in their favor, um, mainly when they wanted to build nationalist narratives against, you know, the neighbors in, in the region and in Kosovo is specifically in relation uh, to Serbia. And uh, uh, second is the courts and tribunals. We haven't talked about the reconciliation process as a process in which our people would literally get justice, but also talking to victims, talking to one another, but also talking genuinely about what has happened, uh, understanding the fact that there were victims from the Albanians, but also from the, you know, the Serbs here in Kosovo. But we all focus on, let's see what the ICTY will say. Let's see what you know, a, a tribunal uh, will, will, will say. There are cases you know, with a, with a, a court in, in Serbia. There has been one case, Bukujevsi case, case, which we all know uh, in Belgrade, or like now with the special court here, you know, uh, the Kosovo court established in The Hague trying to bring justice to the victims. But we never talk to, uh, about, uh, the the actual lives, the actual stories. We never made an effort on the societal level to actually try to uh, to start this process. Being perceived as highly political, being perceived as something that should go through the courts, that's what actually kept it on hold. Uh, what the EU tried to do in Kosovo, also like in the region, I mean, you see there are a lot of regional initiatives in which they include also Albania in the reconciliation process, because in one way we have been affected from everything that has happened, although they haven't been uh, directly involved in, 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 in the wars. But then you see that uh, um, all these, you know, initiatives from the EU, uh, they have been in a way created the expectations that the EU should do it, uh, that, you know, we are doing this for the sake of the EU, that, you know, we are doing this because at the end of the road that there is going to be NATO and EU integration. I mean, this is the lives of the citizens. This shouldn't be connected to the EU integration process, nor NATO integration process. They, they are separate ones. Uh, in, in these cases, we have to deliver on the reforms, uh, but not necessarily link even reconciliation to, to this, because otherwise it's just going to be artificially sort of induced process. And, and uh, if we don't do this genuinely, then we shouldn't do it at all. I mean, what is, what is the point of doing it for the sake of Brussels and ticking the box for, you know, like bureaucrats in Brussels, because they don't have the, the same level of sensitivity towards the the uh, what happened in 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 the Balkans, especially in the nineties. The the generations are changing. People who have been directly involved in the Balkans, even the the politicians from from the EU, but also US and other countries, are in a way either going to retirement or they are not there anymore. So it's going to be very hard to expect uh, for the reconciliation to be taken over and managed from the outside. Thank you, Danica. What are the biggest challenges in the process of reconciliation? And what are the strategies to overcome those challenges? How are they affecting positively and negatively? Uh, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, challenges are that we don't we don't listen to each other i mean if you see uh in kosovo uh just recently i mean now with the special court it's also like a sense of denial that you know even the serbs were victims i mean because of of we the fact that we couldn't really deliver on on dealing with the past i mean in the past 20 years there is this rage accumulated that uh the, 
and the feeling that there is no justice. Uh, and, and this kind of made us feel that we are the, the biggest victim in here. And without, you know, us being uh, in a way uh, solving this and closing this chapter, we, we cannot accept the fact that there are other victims as well. Then there is Vucic, you know, who denies the Rachak. And Rachak was, was, was one of the biggest massacre, which in a way also triggered NATO intervention in Kosovo. And then you have, you know, Serbia creating this narrative that what happened in the past 20, in, in, in 20 years ago, you know, it's the past now, and then the Serbia has changed without actually dealing with it, without taking responsibility for what happened, not just in Kosovo, but also uh, in Bosnia and Croatia, kind of, you know, further fueled and, and created even more obstacles in the Process. And then, of course, there are the political elites. I mean, if you see, uh, if you have like corrupt political elites, which never hesitated to even use, you know, the victims and the cases uh, in their favor to further strengthen their position internally to create uh, uh, nationalist narratives against one another, but also uh, against the EU, then you really see that uh, uh, the, the challenges that we we don't want to deal with it in a genuine way. Now in Kosovo, there is this new initiative that is uh, related to Sui and Serbia for genocide, which then again opens yet another uh, uh, very complex uh, chapter for Kosovo uh, when, when it comes to, to, to dealing with the past. Because I mean, uh, genocide is, uh, is something that is huge, something that takes a lot of time. And if we don't have it documented, then it's going to be be super hard to actually make our case. I mean, you know, the case of Srebrenica was only that element that has been considered, uh, you know, uh, uh, with uh, genocide elements and, and not not the Sarajevo siege, for instance. And when when uh, these, you know, the governments use this nationalist rhetoric, uh, it it's just contributes negatively to the entire process. Uh, what we would want to see, you know, the first step is documentation of all victims. Second is like really go after each case. I mean, uh, most of the time we hear about ICTY and say like, oh, but Milosevic ended there. Yes, but then uh, I mean, how many times Milosevic has been uh, in the in the case against him? Kosovo has been mentioned because there was Bosnia, there was Croatia, there was Kosovo, and like large scale cases. Uh, did we deal with, you know, small scale cases that actually, you know, deal with people's life directly uh, or like the missing people and the reluctance of Serbia, for instance, to share information when it comes to the locations and, and potential uh, uh, potential locations. Now we just have one that is uh, uh, being uh, sort of uh, um, uh, worked on. So, you know, like without this, without uh, sitting with each other, hearing each other's story, uh, genuinely uh, uh, talking about uh, this process, we cannot we cannot see any positive uh, any positive result. Um, now with Kosovo, we have this new government, and they are creating this institute on on uh, uh, war crimes and all. But um, I think this is probably the second or the third that is being created. Each government had its own institute without continuation in the process. There was this, you know, uh, initiative at the presidential level, and then there is was. Uh, so we didn't even manage to create an institute that will continuously work on this in order to then, you know, talk about uh, concrete cases in which we can uh, we can move forward with. Um, this is, I mean, the first step, depoliticizing it to the point that, you know, we will just talk about it because uh, it's important for us, and not important for Brussels or for political elites. Uh, and this is uh, documentation and then talking about it. And then of course, having the courts, supporting the courts. Uh, and uh, uh, what would also be ideal is uh, to basically close the chapter of having politicians and leaders in the Balkans that were linked to the wars in the nineties. I mean, this doesn't, a person who has been involved in that period cannot uh, really allow the country to move forward and have forward looking approach. They would always be trapped in uh, whatever they were involved in the 90s. And this is negatively contributing to the entire uh, region. Um, and then uh, of course, uh, common history, which is super tricky. I mean, there was one project and in Kosovo it backlash to, to the extent that, you know, uh, really, uh, 
uh, they almost crucified the person who has been part of this uh, project because there has been this initiative on creating common history. But uh, it's almost impossible. What we can do is at least do not to not have uh, uh, stories and histories that actually build narratives against each other. But having this common, uh, super common and unified uh, story about what happened in the 90s is probably almost impossible. And again, this was project led by the EU, project supported by the EU financially. And if it wasn't for the financial incentives, I'm sure that people wouldn't even do it. And then it wasn't sustainable. So um, this is another problem that uh, we are facing. In Kosovo, for instance, uh, we have schools that run on parallel systems. Uh, there is one of Kosovo and then one of Serbia that actually I'm, I'm pretty sure that they, they learn about history in a completely different way. And these people live in, in one country and these people actually will talk to each other and have to talk to each other because they literally, their lives are interlinked. And just imagine how these people will perceive each other if we constantly infuse them with, uh, with stories that are built to basically hate each other rather than, you know, uh, uh, consider each other as, as uh, co-citizens uh, uh, and, and fellow citizens in, uh, residing in one country. Mm -hmm. um, so, let me ask you how, because you mentioned a bit also politics and how politics also influence reconcil reconciliation. I would like to ask you, especially the role of the media mm. in the region, because I think it's an interesting one. So maybe if you can comment on that. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, if you see how the media is reporting on a special court, for instance, in Kosovo, then you will see how sensitive these issues are. Uh, for instance, now uh, it has been very interesting because uh, the special court has been adopted, I mean, it has been published in the parliament, it has been voted and went through, and now the party that actually pushed for it now is against. And then you can see how they use their, their media to actually change the narrative, uh, not just towards the special court, but also towards the past and blaming on the government, because in Kosovo, like we, we have changed the roles, because uh, previously the party that now is in the government and is like trying not to interfere in the work of the special court, with Vendosie, it was against. I mean, we had tear gas in the parliament for many issues, including the special court. And then uh, the party that is now in the opposition and opposing it has voted for it and pushed for it while in, in, in power back in the days in 2016 when it was uh, established. So now, you know, like well, they just changed uh, uh, places. And then of course the media is there. The media is there first because it's, uh, it's, it's business. I mean, this issue is, it's a hot topic. Of course, then, they will, it will get a lot of attention and it will get a lot of clicks. I mean, we have click oriented media, uh, first of all. Second is the media that is uh, uh, linked to political parties or linked to specific leaders, which can further, you know, like create uh, narratives in relation to, to uh, these issues. Not just reconciliation in Kosovo is like strictly special court. I mean, at this point, I see no room to talk about reconciliation because now we are already, you know, too busy talking about how unfair the special court is because it's only dealing with Albanians and crimes of Albanians towards the others, and how monoethnic is uh, this court, how hybrid and, and uh, one of a kind the court is. So basically everything evolves around that. And you have no idea how sensitive it is and the level of debate that it triggers in, 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 uh, uh, in, in our everyday uh, lives. I mean, constantly there have been people who have been uh, arrested. I mean, there are two, two persons in The Hague who ended up in The, in the Hague because of uh, their um, uh, pre over presence in the media. Uh, which were then, you know, considered to be a threat to potential victims or, or witnesses. So they were like literally arrested because of a potential interference with the work of the special court. And all of that happened in the media. I mean, we literally saw footage of people, you know, sending files and, 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 and uh, to, to, uh, to one of the offices here in Pristina, claiming that they have also the names of the witnesses and all, revealing details of the work of, and, and cases of the special court. So uh, the media is very important. And if the media wants 
in a way to contribute positively to the process they can. I mean, there, are, there have been a lot of cases in which uh, basically media people, artists really had successful stories. I mean, there is Medita Doberdan, you know, this festival that takes place in Belgrade. I mean, of course there are protests and all, but they have sent, you know, clear messages and they really shown a very good, uh, good uh, level of cooperation. Uh, but then uh, these stories are limited. We don't get to see these stories every day. What we get to see is stories that actually contribute to, let's heat the debate uh, furthermore, let's, you know, negatively contribute to the process and let's, you know, go back to the legacies of the 90s and, and talk about who the actual uh, victim was and, and, and who was the oppressor. So uh, unfortunately, this is the role of the media that we see today in Kosovo is extremely heated and, and in Serbia is equally the same. I mean, the tabloids are, I mean, I think they are even learning and translating from the Serbian media. In Kosovo, there is a lot of news that is being sort of just copied and pasted from uh, Vucic controlled media and being put out here in Kosovo. So um, in a way, uh, it, it has been negatively contributing to the process. Uh, and uh, I don't see this changing anytime soon. Uh, and especially now with in Kosovo, with a special court, it's a totally different uh, reality that we are going to deal with. Let me ask you, how do you see the readiness? Um, I mean, we talked a bit about the readiness of the politicians to, to contribute to reconciliation and you seemed a bit pes pessimistic in this way. But let's talk about the common people. So how do you see the readiness of the people, let's say, for an example, in Kosovo to contribute to reconciliation and especially those who are young, to this young generation who was born in the 90s or after the wars? I mean, their perception towards the war might be different, less emotional. I mean, they, they, they know the stories, but uh, it's different when you don't experience something. So there is room uh, to shape them positively in a way that, you know, at least in the young generations, we would see a lot of uh, willingness to do so. But we don't. I mean, even in Serbia and in Kosovo, there have been also a lot of research done, like surveys and uh, quantitative research, which showed that, you know, uh, the youth were even more nationalist than actually the, the old ones who have been going through the war and have been experienced everything. And that's, of course, being shaped by the by the politics, narratives uh, uh, built by the by the politics, but also uh, by the current media. Uh, in, in Kosovo, there has been no room to discuss about this, to be honest. I mean, uh, in the beginning, it was very hard for us because... Um, even with with you know the having international presence, it was we we were either relying on unmake and then new Lex and then no courts in here and then you know the special court and on on a societal level we were just in a way failing to to even you know uh, create a common narrative in this regard and uh, let alone to actually extend our our uh, our cooperation with the with the local Serbs to talk about this. I mean there are some minor initiatives and from both both sides, NGOs participating in, in these initiatives are, you know, being attacked and targeted uh, by, by political parties. I mean, and, and this is uh, very problematic. In, in Kosovo, there was only one person who served as the former uh, political advisor to Putin, his previous government. And uh, he, uh, in one of the TV interviews, he just, you know, supported the work of the special court. And it wasn't, you know, a strong statement. It was that the, there were crimes and we have to deal with each victim and, and, and each case. And there were backlashes. Uh, and then the Kurti was pressured to actually dismiss him. And this really showed how sensitive this, this, uh, this debate is. I mean, if you really go out there and talk about this issue and how, how ready the society is uh, to, to actually accept you and, and, and listen. Uh, and with this special court, this is becoming even, even hard now because every time you wanna mention this topic, they go like, look, you know, like 20 years ago, 
the, Serbia was the oppressor and now we are dealing with the special court uh, and then Serbia is denying the crimes. So like we, we, we constantly get engaged in this discussion that has it's never ending and it's heavily, heavily uh, influenced by politics rather than uh, the importance of, uh, of the, of the um, uh, lives of the citizens. So uh, I don't think we are ready. And uh, I think that even for those the NGOs, because unfortunately it's all, all the work of the NGOs in this regard, uh, no, uh, no uh, initiatives led by uh, the government's serious initiatives, genuine initiatives haven't been uh, run so far. Uh, it's always that they receive um, backlash. Uh, and uh, again, reconciliation will be looked at from the courts and tribunals perspective. And every time someone tries to bring it up, it's gonna be, we have the special court and that's enough. Uh, so we are missing the human uh, uh, part of it and human touch of it. Thank you. Uh, what, can you what can we expect from the future and what can be done better and how can the EU even more contribute? Um, the EU should stop thinking that the money is going to solve everything. I mean, uh, this is the problem. I, I know that for the EU, it's like we have extra funds, let's give it for reconciliation. Uh, but then, you know, like the results are, are never there. And then uh, there is frustration towards the EU, even from the countries, but also from the from the EU itself, being tired of constantly investing in something that is not really uh, uh, producing any tangible result. Because, you know, when you when you uh, ask me about the positive uh, example, I couldn't think of one just, you know, besides Zerecon, which, you know, at some point they were even... Uh, struggling for funds and support, which which is you know quite problematic. Uh, what the EU can do is just that. Um, what also we try to do is bring models, you know, bring. And uh, in, in our case, we're stealing the best elements from the best models uh, that took place in Europe after, after the Second World War. We tried with a Franco-German dialogue. And then from there, we moved to this you know, paper that we have recently produced, uh, which is uh, focuses on the Polish-German uh, case. So we are just trying to get the best models and see how that we can replicate or we can, we can use them here in the Balkans. What the EU can do is like literally work with youth. Uh, informal education is super important, you know, like bring uh, uh, people to people communication is super important. Uh, people have to know each other. I mean, people shouldn't be able to make the difference between the Milosevic regime, the government and the actual people in, in Serbia. There is a huge difference, just like in Kosovo that, the, you know, there, are, there have been a major differences between, you know, what the government is and what the people are. So uh, when, when it comes to human to human uh, communication, we have really good cooperation. I mean, and, and this has been again done at, at the level of the NGOs. Uh, and, and this is quite sad because it's very limited in capacities, but also like in, in, in the impact that it has given the, the, the capacities that the NGOs have. But, you know, invest in education, in people to people communication, uh, exchange is really important in academia. I think that's when uh, it all should start. I mean, uh, we are part of Erasmus, but, uh, you know, like exchange uh, within the region has been almost uh, impossible. Now they're moving forward with it. And I think this is very important because this is the only way we actually make sure that people are talking to each other. And then, you know, these people will go back to their countries and then, you know, will uh, create their own narrative based on their own experience rather than through the media, through the government or through uh, other people. Uh, so this is really important. And uh, I, sh I, I don't believe that reconciliation should be linked to EU integration process or NATO integration process. I mean, there you can deliver on reforms and really do it. But dealing with the past should not be seen as a technical process to tick the box. It should really genuinely happen in every segment of the society. And that needs stamina, needs a lot of investment, and, and needs a lot of genuine approach from all sides. Last but not least, does the past impact the now? Yes, and the future. And uh, like, I cannot, I mean, Balkans, it's probably, I mean, uh, 
probably because I live here and I can I can see how it affects the everyday life. Uh, uh, everything that happened, even though it's 20 years ago, one would say like it has been two decades ago and, and generations are changing. Even like political elites in Kosovo have changed. Now we don't have the, uh, I mean, the government is for the first time formed by people who haven't been part of the war, who haven't been part of KLA. Uh, we have made that detachment from, from the past. I mean, this is the, the what, what we think that uh, or we created the perception that the situation is but you know this affects every day of our life I mean in the parliament today instead of talking about COVID we talk about the, the 90s in the parliament instead of talking about economic recovery we talk about the special court and and uh, again about the war and who did what and and what happened during the war we cannot create a common narrative we use it against each other and this is the case also in Serbia and, and in Bosnia and in Croatia so this shouldn't be uh, the case, but uh, it affects just not just the now, it affects how the future will look like. And that's why I said in the beginning, without closing that chapter, we cannot have uh, countries that are built in uh, to, to have a forward looking approach. And, and this means that our youngsters will be still uh, uh, caught in, 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 in the traps set in the 90s instead of, uh, instead of you just, just living the lives that they deserve to live uh, with all the possibilities that are out there, not just in the region, but also in the EU. Dear Danica, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you.